Hey, I was uh, I had a I was in an interview this morning at uh, we were interviewing a candidate for a position here this morning, and I was just thinking in that interview how thankful I was. Lindsay Roop was in there, Jeff Wallace was in there, Amber Stanley. I'm so thankful. And so take a second, the people that are around you that are here over J term, just turn to somebody and say that you're thankful that you're they're here for they're here for J term with you. I think, uh, I think it can get easy. It can get easy to get bogged down in social media, seeing where people are traveling and feeling like grinding out a, a class or a class and a half or spending time here. But uh, I am thankful that you're here. I'm thankful that we're on campus. I'm thankful that it's above freezing out. And I am uh, thankful that this is only the second week of J-Term. And so some of those connections that you're making with people or maybe meeting even some new people on campus can continue. So. I'm excited to introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, Lisa serves as the pastor of discipleship down at Common Way Church in Muncie. I know there's some of you that attend down there. Uh, so Lisa is from Southwest Michigan. Uh, originally, she went, she attended Michigan State and played volleyball there. Um, after she graduated, she was able to come back to campus and work with crew or athletes in action. Some of you are familiar with that. Uh, so she was able to work at her alma mater there for, I think, eight years uh, before accepting a position at a church out in Muncie, Christ Community Church. She served out there for a little while and then just recently came back, accepted this position as uh, pastor of discipleship at Common Way in August of, of 2021. And she gets a chance to come up uh, and share with us a little bit. I think it's her first time on campus. Is that right? Oh, she drove past once, probably took a picture in front of the sign out here. But now she's here at a little more substance. So would you please give a warm Taylor welcome to Lisa Ashton. Oh, I can already tell you guys are going to be fun this morning. So uh, That's great. I, I didn't even need to write on my notes, have fun. I think you're going to help take care of that for me. But uh, it is so good to be with you. Good morning, Taylor. You have a tremendous reputation. Um, ever since I've been in high school, I heard of how great Taylor was. And the last 20 years, it continues. So it's a privilege to be with you today. Well, I want to take you to the streets of Brooklyn, New York. A little different than Upland, as I'm learning, as I've been here. Just a little different. It was about 12 years ago, and I rolled up on a curb in Brooklyn, New York, right in front of the doors of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. By any chance, has anyone been there? Someone? Okay. Jim Cimbala's church. He's written some amazing books on prayer, and uh, they have benefited my life. And my friend said, hey, I'm going out to this conference at the Brooklyn Tabernacle for leaders and pastors, and would you like to come with me? And I said, absolutely. I was in the middle of a sabbatical at the time. I was seeking God for what's next. I had been in campus ministry for about seven years, and I was just in this space, the land in between. Some of you know that land in between of saying, God, I don't know what's next. And so I went to this conference in Brooklyn expecting just to, to receive from God. And, and they had this incredible reputation of prayer. And I was excited to go to their prayer meeting on Tuesday nights. And um, surprisingly enough, that it was like their biggest day of the, the week. It was more important to them than their Sunday mornings. And so I was just like a kid on Christmas morning, couldn't wait to get to this prayer meeting to hear what all the, you know, uh, in, uh, amazing praises were about this, this time where the spirit of God was thick. So I rolled up in this car, I got out on the curb and, and the man that drove me and my friend there, he yells out and I'll never forget it. He said, now go get you your blessing. Never forget that. Now go get you your blessing. And I'm like, I am going to go get my blessing. So we went into this prayer meeting and we walked in. We're at least 15 minutes early and all, already down the, down the aisles, they were filled with people. Down the aisles, filled with people standing in line. And what I love about the city is that it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, brown, white, 
all different languages spoken. I mean, every, pro I felt like I was in heaven. When we were saying holy, 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 imagining what heaven's gonna be like when you're with people from around the globe, that's what I felt like in this place. And people were lining up, ready to receive prayer. And so I, I said, see you, Hannah, I'm, I'm getting in line. I'm gonna get me my blessing. And so I stood and I waited, and that's always, if you've ever been in that spot, it's, it's kind of vulnerable and you're a little nervous. You're like, what's gonna happen? And I just said, God, I'm gonna ask for everything. I'm just gonna ask. And so I, it was my turn and I went up, I remember it was left front right over here. And the lady says, how can I pray for you? And I was like, okay, we've got. <laughs> and so I, I, I remember four things. I just kind of covered the bases. I had some health issues at the time, obviously some vo vocational direction. I wanted to pray for my sister who still to this day doesn't know Jesus. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna throw in boys too. I said, we've got, we've got to pray about boys, right ladies? You know, I always throw that in there. So um, I was up there for kind of a while because I had a long list. And then I sat down and my, my friend whispered, she's like, you were up there a long time. And I said, I had a lot to ask for. But let me tell you something. To this day, I don't remember exactly like in terms of results or outcomes of those prayers. That didn't matter to me as much as this, how I felt afterwards, and how I experienced the love of God through the woman who prayed for me, how I experienced the presence of God while I was in that place, how my faith was strengthened. And, and, and this, is, this is what the blessing was. It was in the act of receiving through somebody else. And I felt like I connected with God in a deep way because I accepted the invitation to ask someone to pray for me. And that is where we're going to go this morning. Connecting with God when we have a need. Connecting with God when we have a need. And I'm wondering today, do you have a need? Maybe multiple. I was with fifth graders yesterday in Sunday morning church. I was their sub-teacher. <laughs> First time. And I said, do you guys have any, you know, things you're worried about this week? And they just stared at me like, no, nothing. I'm like, nothing? I said, I got about 10. I said, I've got needs. So I'm wondering, you know, are any of you feeling worried about something in your life? Anxious? Afraid? You're starting a new year, you're starting a new term. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's not kind of on the, the negative need side, maybe it's this positive if you really wanna work hard in school or you, you're, you're growing some exciting friendships or maybe you've gotten in a new relationship. Maybe you find yourself in a place of desperation this morning. Maybe you're in a place of you're pleading with God and saying, God, you've got to do something. Maybe you're struggling in a place of doubt. And as I mentioned, faith, or I'm, excuse me, I mentioned prayer and you're like, I don't even know if prayer works. I don't even know if I like prayer. You know, I don't know where you're at today. But I want you to be thinking about needs that you have. I believe we all have them. And I believe that God wants to connect with us in our place of need and he wants to draw near to you. He wants to draw near to you and for you to know his, his loving presence. And I have found that this more often happens when we're in a position, a posture of humility to ask. That's God. He says, I dwell in a high and holy place, but I also dwell with the lowly and the contrite in spirit. And he draws near to those who are humble enough to say, I can't do this on my own. I need help. So some of the moments in my life where I have felt most deeply connected to God and experienced Him have followed my willingness to admit a need and say, I need prayer. And so I'm wondering this morning, have you ever, at, have you ever viewed asking for prayer as a way for you to connect with God? As a way for you to connect to the heart of the one who deeply loves you? So we're going to look at a, a little bit of scripture this morning and specifically at some um, godly leaders who, who ask people to pray for them. And as I go through some of these verses, we're just going to kind of do an, I'm using my clicker, I don't even have it in my hand. <laughs> we're going to just kind of do a, a quick survey of just a few characters. I'm not going to go deep into the scripture, I just want us to see a theme and for us to look at a few. And as I was thinking about stories in the Bible, I came to the story of Esther. You remember uh, Queen Esther? She was at a, a very 
uh, pivotal time in the, the history of, of the Jews, her people, and God raised her up for, for a moment when she could approach the king and have a very bold request and basically say, save us from being annihilated. And I love this verse, and we're gonna start looking for the themes now as we read these verses together. Well, I'll read it, you can listen, how about that? So, Esther 4.16, she said, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do, and when this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And I thought, man, what a rock star. She's bold. Okay, so her plead was what? Fast for me. And we know the end of the story that, that uh, God granted her favor and used her to save her people. Next, thought of Daniel. Remember Daniel and his three friends? King Nebuchadnezzar there in exile in Babylon had a dream and none of the wisest of the wisest wise guys, freaking King Nebuchadnezzar could interpret his dream so he was ready to wipe them all out. And Daniel's like, no, no, wait a minute. Maybe I know a God in heaven who could maybe help me interpret this dream. So what does he do? Daniel 2, 17 through 18, it says, then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So he gathered his three buddies. I can't imagine walking in the door and being like, guys, dude, we've got to pray or we're going to die. You've got to pray that God will help me understand and interpret this dream. Okay, so that's some Old Testament. Let's go to New Testament. First guy I think about is Paul, he was constantly asking for prayer in all his letters. Colossians 4.3, when he's writing the church of Colossae, what does he say? And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am, excuse me, in chains. And right before that, he had said, devote yourselves to prayer and be watchful and careful. He says, but pray for us too. Here was the spiritual giant that knew he needed to ask, that was fully aware of weaknesses in his life and wanted to ask even the churches he helped build to pray for him. We have another example in 1 Thessalonians, um, whoops, I clicked, all right, 1 Thessalonians 5.25. But very briefly, brothers and sisters, he said, pray for us. And the church in Thessalonica, there were so many new converts there. And I thought, how cool. You know, sometimes we don't think to ask people who have just begun a relationship with God to pray for us. But Paul recognized that they could be used by God to bless him and further his mission. So he wasn't afraid to ask. 1 Thessalonians 3.1, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it is with you. Last example, don't know who wrote Hebrews, author's unknown, but this author wrote this, Hebrews 13, 18, he said, pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. And continued on, and particularly this person said, I urge you to pray that I can be restored to you soon. So, what can we gather from these verses? Well, I thought four basic observations I made as I thought about all this. I'm like, if you're in a place to be able to ask people for prayer, number one, you have to have faith. You have to believe that God cares enough and that he wants to actually help you. We can't take that for granted. So these people believe, hey, this is beyond me and I need to ask and I believe that God cares for me, he can do something about it. Number two, they had an awareness of their need. They knew what to ask for, fully aware. I think sometimes we just don't take enough time in the presence of God or even in our relationships to even know deep down what is is the needs that I have and what's the need beneath the need? To saying, God, search me and know me. What are my needs? Third, they had friends. They had people, they had community that they could ask. 
This is something, uh, when it comes to my life, when it comes to me choosing the people closest to me in my circles, the people I want to spend time with, I'm talking about the inner circle friends, you know? More often than not, one of the biggest qualities I look for is, are these people who pray? I want friends who, who pray, who enjoy to be with God and can share in that with me. That's what I look for in spiritual friends. And so all of these people had someone to ask, and we can't dismiss that this, <laughs> that this isn't important. So I wonder, do you have people in your life, in your close circle of friends, that if you asked, hey, could you pray for me? They'd be like, yeah, I'm on it. I was just in the car ready to, to come into chapel. I brought a friend with me, Aaron, and uh, we parked and I said, Aaron, let's, can we just pause and pray before I go in? And I said, and as a way of walking out when I'm gonna stand in front of a room full of people to ask, could you pray for me? And she did. And uh, it was a blessing to me. So friends, do you have friends? Do you surround yourself with people? I don't, I don't just assume because you're at a Christian school that this is normal, okay? So do you. And then fourth, they asked. They asked. They had the courage, they had the humility to ask, and they knew that their need was beyond themselves. They wanted a touch of God. All right, so to review, they had faith, awareness, friends, and they asked. And when I wrote that down, I was like, F-A-F-A, fa fa <laughs> Does it mean anything? I didn't plan that, but it helped me remember it. I'm not always one that has to come up with acronyms. But. So those are some observations I see in terms of scripture, in terms of godly people that were able to practice this. And I want you to know that this is something that I struggle with too. It's something that I try to remember to, to be aware of and to ask. And, I, and, and I've, I've really noticed in my last year and a half of, of, of being uh, working in a church leading small groups, sometimes for adults, uh, Sunday morning services, if we have an invitation for people to come forward. And I'm like, are, are we good at, at being able to receive prayer, at being able to walk up and say, yes, I want that. And you know what? I think there's so much room for growth in this area. How many of you have been in a small group? You get to prayer time and it's like, who needs prayer? No one says anything. Or the stuff you say is about somebody else because you don't want to actually admit that you have something of a need or the invitation is made at the end of a service and no one comes forward or the prayer room's empty. You know, those, those are just some observations that I've noticed and I think, man, that's kind of the, one of the best deals going. Why don't we take advantage of it? Well, I think there's barriers to that, but I also want to discuss benefits when it comes to asking for prayer. So the barriers, is it a faith issue? Is it an awareness issue? A friends issue? Is it an asking issue? And I think more often than not, I think it's an asking issue. I think plain and simple, it's just too vulnerable sometimes for us. Vulnerable, I like to say, uh, comes from the word to, to be woundable. It means you open yourself up to be seen. It can be a scary place. Or we, we may dismiss and say, my, my knee's not it's not that big of a deal. I mean, compared to so-and-so, I'm doing fine. Have we ever compared with other people? You say, Lisa, I can't do that because then if I do that, then people will know that I have needs. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but, but, but then they're gonna know that I'm weak. Well, yeah, you are. Well, then, then they're gonna know that I don't have it all together. You don't. <laughs> Same goes for me. I'm needy, I'm weak, I don't have it all together. My first lesson in vulnerability came when I, that I can really remember um, when I was playing volleyball at Michigan State. Now to let you know, I had no business playing for the Spartans. I came from a small town. I didn't play volleyball very long in high school, but I was just in the right place at the right time during a competition and the coach recruited me to walk on. So I'm like, Lord, I don't belong here, but I'm gonna try really hard. If I can play one year, that's awesome. I was so bad, they kicked me out of drills my freshman year, guys. <laughs> I was playing with these All-Americans. I just couldn't keep up, but I'm like, I'm not quitting. Fast forward to my senior year. I, I had earned a starting position. I was defense. I'm short. You may not think so, but I was the shortest on my team. My opposite was 6'4". So, so uh, I know, she's tall. Um, so I'd earned a starting position. I'd earned a full-ride scholarship, and I was co-captain of the team. By God's grace. 
And I was going to my senior year thinking, this is going to be amazing, this is great. And guess what? I had a career-ending injury, a back injury, just as the Big Ten season was starting. It was crushing. And I was struggling, and I was in the weight room, my coach noticed that, and he's like, Lisa, you're having a hard time, aren't you? Yeah. You know, you should probably let your team know that, because they already know that anyway. <laughs> you should probably be open with them. So we were on the road a few days later, and I decided to bring the team in. I called a team meeting. We sat down. I can still remember the hotel room, and I just kind of laid it out there, and I said, guys, my season's over. I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time, but I need you. And that was my first lesson in vulnerability, of learning what does it look like to be open with people in your needs and what does it look like to allow people to care for you in that moment. And sometimes when you kind of get this nudge of, I, kinda, I need to do this, I need to talk to somebody about it, I need to ask for prayer, there is way more in that action of obedience that God has for you than you expect. God's beautiful like this. He has more intentions, more ways that he wants to bless you beyond the actual act of asking or what you think you need. He has way more. He wants you to feel that, you know, his love, his care, his comfort, his healing. Another story, I, I was in Omaha, Nebraska. I was there for 10 years working at a church. And... Um, Long story short, I was coming up on a very, very, very difficult conversation, personally. Ended up being one of the most, I'm not exaggerating, one of the most excruciating conversations of my life. It was gonna be on a Friday, and I thought, I need some people to pray for me before I enter into this conversation. And I had many who were, and I remember going to our staff prayer meeting for my, with, with my staff, at the church I was working at, and we were a large church, and usually there was about 40 of us that were in staff prayer. And I remember thinking, God, there's three specific pastor friends that I wanna ask for prayer, um, but it's, it's too much of a delicate situation. I mean, they knew my story. I said, I just don't know how to go about asking. I'm exhausted, and I don't know what to do, but I'd really like them to pray for, them, for me and to know that, that Friday's coming. Well, I sat down at this table first, and guess where the people that sat at that table with me that morning? My three friends. The exact people on my mind that I said, God, I need them to pray for me. And it turned out that the way that that prayer time happened, they changed the schedule. <laughs> and I was able to tell them over the table, guys, this is coming. They were aware of the situation. I said, it's Friday, could you pray? And they said, we're gonna go and take you over to that area of couches, Lisa, and we're gonna pray for you. And I'll never forget it, guys. I sat on this couch and I had these three men, two counseling pastors and my discipleship pastor, and they knelt in front of me and they prayed. And it brought me to tears. And to this day, I get a little choked up talking about it. But even in that moment, the act, there was healing that happened for me. Just the demonstration of these men, due to the issue that we were praying about, there was healing in that moment, way more than I anticipated. And this brings me to a point of when you want connection, there are two things you need. You need safety and you need vulnerability. So when it comes to you thinking about the people that you ask to pray for you, make sure they're safe, trusted people. And that's what these men were for me and the other examples that I've given you. So safe people to ask, friends that you know you can already trust that keep confidences, people in your Christian community, those in, in, in positions that um, are trusted positions. And I just want to add a word of caution. This whole act of, of prayer can be an intimate thing, okay? So this isn't to be used to manipulate intimacy or um, to speed up a dating process, for instance. I remember I, I was on a second date with a guy, and, and he was ready. We are going to go to our cars, and it was nighttime, and he wanted to, he's like, let's pray. And he grabs my hand, he wants to go for a walk, and I'm thinking, dude, this is just too intense. I just met you, you know? I'm like... Cool it. So anyway, I just say that there's a time and a place. And um, it's not to be used to hit on somebody you like, all right? But make sure that there is trust there. So connection, safety, and vulnerability. It is a way to abide with Jesus. It is a way to connect with him. 
And I like to say prayer is being at home with God. Sometimes we just think of, of the results of prayer and I'm learning that more and more it's, it's about being, it's about communion, it's about presence. And I haven't always thought this way, but I'm coming to learn the mystery of prayer and the wonder of it all. And I have, I have been blown away by, by answers that are miraculous and I've been in the depths of despair wondering where God is and if my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling of heaven. Have you been there? You even wonder if it's working. But Jesus says, I want you to keep asking. I want you to keep asking. I heard this at a prayer retreat recently. We can approach prayer with kind of four different beliefs. One, believing that nothing happens. Well, that's no fun, why are you doing it? Two, what we ask always happens. I don't think that's true. We can believe that sometimes something happens. Or this is what I think, something always happens. To believe that something will always happen when we take that risk to pray. So in application today, I wanna encourage you this with the semester, is making the spiritual practice of asking people, will you pray for me? And I encourage you to start with this kind of prayer. It can be in your own little words, but as you go about life, God, help me to be aware of my true needs. Show me who to ask for prayer and give me courage. Help me to be aware of my true needs. Show me who to ask for prayer because it's about timing. It's about wisdom. And give me the courage to do it. And then when the time comes, just simply say, hey, can you pray for me? For you, the first step might be something that's less threatening, maybe a, a text, although the person's not with you. But I encourage you to do this in person. I encourage you to be able to do this in person. And you may say, oh, I don't know, it's vulnerable, I might cry, I might feel awkward. Yes, all of those things are true. It just might happen. But I encourage you to take that risk because I think with those, those five words, Will you pray for me? It'll help you connect with God. And he probably has way more in that, inv in that invitation than you are expecting. I wanna close and be able to pray for you this morning. And so I'm gonna lead you in this prayer that I just have up on that screen. And I'm just gonna pause after each one of those requests and I'm gonna ask the Spirit of God that maybe he brings to mind your need this morning, and maybe he'll bring to mind somebody or a group of friends that you can ask. Does that sound good? So let's, let's bow our heads. Spirit of God, I ask that you awaken our spiritual senses to know your voice this morning. And I simply uh, offer this prayer to you for my new friends here at Taylor. And so you can pray in the quiet of your heart this prayer, God, help me be aware of my true needs. Show me who to ask for prayer. And give me courage when the time is right to say, will you pray for me? Jesus, I thank you that you made a way possible for us to approach you in prayer because of your death on the cross, because of your, um, the door that you opened for us to, to come to the Father and ask whatever is on our heart and mind and know that you care about us and you wanna meet us with your loving presence. And so God, I just, I just ask for every person in this room, Lord, that you'd help stoke a, a, more of a, a burning flame inside of, of wanting to connect with you deeply and knowing that sometimes it can be through other people that care about them. That they can be a channel, that they can be a branch that's abiding in you and, and through them, 
be a blessing and a way to connect them with you. So Lord, would you help us with that? Would you help us to learn uh, to be courageous and to trust you in those vulnerable spaces? And I just ask for your good, perfect, pleasing will for this university and over this body of students. And ask this in your name. Amen. Well, you have been a joy to be with this morning. Thank you. And uh, I'll close with this. Now go get you your blessing. Thank you.